Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us L.M. Stamper, who's the Managing Director with Evermore Wealth, and we'll be talking today about retirement planning for women. Stamp, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good morning. Hey, I'm looking forward to talking with you. It's always neat to get people's perspectives on specific topics. And I know retirement planning is very broad and really uh, focusing on women. I'm certain we will talk about some really good differences because I think that um, many people know, well, um, if you are a male, then here's some things. Or if you're a female or women or, or head of household, all of that ties into your advice um, regarding retirement planning. So I'm interested right. in learning your perspectives there. Give us a little bit of your background and what your entrepreneurial journey has been up to this point. Well, certainly, certainly. So I am a retirement planner in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, I've been so for the past 11 years. Uh, my Actually, my background is in real estate. So it's kind of one of those scenarios where you go to school for one thing and you end up doing something totally different, Yeah, uh, which is great, <laughs> which is great. Um, but yeah, so, you know, my, my entrepreneurial, I guess, uh, journey would be just starting out um, as an advisor. Uh, when I first started, it was, you know, like most business owners, you don't really have a niche market and you just kind of help anybody and everybody. But that then morphed into, I actually started working with dentists, uh, and then that morphed into really helping serve, in my opinion, an underserved demographic, which is uh, women, uh, women professionals, women over 50 is, is my specific market. Um, and then as time went on, just the idea of that once we get to retirement, you know, how do you take those assets? How do you turn them into income so that you don't run out of money and, and you know, you're keeping an eye on taxes, et cetera? It just uh, just really became an affinity for me. So that's uh, pretty much what I do now. Yeah, and it's always like, um, you know, just slight little pivots. And, and then you start noticing, um, well, you were working with dentists, and then you started noticing there was the, the need for um, women over 50. Was there a, a, a certain string or series of clients you started working with that made you realize, wow, this is a, a, a needed topic? What was it that brought that to your attention? Yeah, you know, I think it was a, a combination of things like, uh, one, it seemed as if I did my best work with the female dentist I was, I was working with. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one thing, you know, from a synergy standpoint. Uh, two, you know, statistically, as a lot of people know, uh, women live longer. Uh, therefore, on the statistical side, they're going to be their surviving spouse. Uh, which means it, it could be two years at the end of their life when they're alone uh, trying to you know, mitigate finances. It could be 10 or 20 years. Um, but as time went on, it just seemed from a synergistic standpoint and from an underserved community standpoint uh, that that's resonated the most with me. And I think I did my best work there. Uh, not to mention I have a three-year-old daughter. Uh, yep, so I'm trying to go. turn her into a financial whiz yes. as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that's really so, good. You know, I just it was just really a natural progression. It wasn't forced at all. Yeah. Um, so I just kind of went where, with wherever the wind took me. Do you find that? Um, I, I think in the back of my mind, I've. I've you, I mean, heard this maybe statistically, but, you know, these days, maybe within the last 10 years, let's say, encompasses these days. But people are no longer just retiring and putting a stake in the ground going, I'm done. They're retiring from their main career and moving into maybe consulting for in the same industry or starting a business. Are you finding that same type of trend with women over 50? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, it's it's very rare that uh, somebody's retiring when you know 65, 67, however old they are, they decide to retire that they just want to stop working, you know, yep. a, or or stop contributing to society. So I would say, uh, for all my clients, at least eighty percent of them do something, you know, that that furthers, you know, something that that's near and dear to their heart, whether it's volunteer work. Yeah. Or to your point, just additional, you know, part-time work uh, still in that industry. And then sometimes it's a totally different industry, something they've always wanted to get into, uh, but they never did. But yeah, very few people just hang up their cleats and yeah. uh, sit on the beach like you see on the TV commercials. Yeah, and maybe they they do that for like a month. 
because it's like I just yeah. need a break. Oh, yeah. But then it gets to the point of okay, I'm I've been so maybe uh, uh, wired to perform, and it doesn't matter if the woman over fifty is a CEO or a business owner, or it doesn't matter. You're just mm-hmm. wired to you know, work. And, and I think that it is great to have that break. Um, I remember years ago reading the book Four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. And he talks about Mm -hmm. why wait until you're X age to retire and do what you want to do, do it now. So set up your time if you own a business or whatever, but set up your life where you can take these mini sabbaticals or mini retirements and take three months and go do this fun thing so that then it, you're not really looking forward to retirement. You're kind of doing these little, you know, uh, hot spots all along the way. So are you finding um, a lot of the women you work with maybe um, already are business owners and then they're just going to throttle back? Or do you find that some are, you know, just working in the corporate world and now they're set re- um, financially because you've worked with them, but now now they really want to do that thing, maybe launch that business because now they have the means and the time to do that. Yeah, I do. I do see some of that. You know, me personally, I encourage that. Um, yeah. Not everyone wants to be a, a business owner. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's it's obviously a different you know bowl of wax. But uh, for a lot of my clients, if they open up that that doorway, uh, meaning while we're having meetings and, and we start talking through things, and they they have an inkling of wanting to start their own business. I highly encourage that. Again, not everyone does that, uh, but I do have a good good handful of clients that that, that want to do that. And, and another thing you'd mentioned, Mike, which is interesting, is is the the desire for early retirement. So I have a lot of clients. You know, it, it, though I work with that demographic, uh, you know, inevitably you do have clients that are younger. Uh, so I have some clients in their thirties and forties. And a, a growing trend that I see is everyone wanting to retire at fifty five or sixty. Huh. You know, regardless of the industry that they're in. And again, yeah. retiring being just like we talked about, walking away or really, I say this all the time, retirement is just cash flow. Yeah, it, That's all it is. I tell people all the time, jokingly, I say, well, you can retire tomorrow if you want. It just comes down to what kind of cash flow your assets are going to produce. So these days, people aren't really wanting to retire just not to work at all. They just want to get to a, a stage where the cash flow from their assets covers all of their expenses you know, and the things that they want to do in life. And that could be because, at any age. Just because that gives it. them the flexibility to do what they want to do when they want to do it. So it, it really, it, it, I just think that it's so neat um, in, in decades past, you know, it used to be like, oh, uh, moonlighting, you would get a little side job on and you'd almost like be ashamed of it. I've got something on the side. Nowadays, it's like the side hustle and, you know, you're, yeah. you do it. <laughs> It's like a badge of honor, like, hey, I, I love this thing, you know, <laughs> and, and it really is that whole financial uh, foundation to give you flexibility. So we've got some F's going there, financial foundation to give you flexibility to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And yeah, it might involve taking that big old trip for a month or whatever, and it might involve giving back time. So I think that that is, um, I, I, I see people in the financial services industry like yourself almost becoming uh, sort of a life coach of sorts because it, you're going, well, wh- where do you see yourself in? And yeah, yeah, the money thing, we have to take care of that. But in order to see what n- amount of money you need, what do you want to do? And I'll bet you that you have some women and, and men, but but you would work with that go, man, I don't know. That's a great question. <laughs> what do you do then? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a lot of life coaching <laughs> going mm-hmm. on uh, when you're a financial planner, you know, depending on what the level that you do it. Uh, but it's really just about passion, you know, finding your passion, finding, you know, what, why you want to get up every morning, you know, whether you're 40, 50 or 70, you know, identifying the passion, making sure that we have the money for it. And one thing that I'd see people do is that I'm not a big budget guy. I know that's probably a no, no as a financial planner. And there's, there's a reason I say that, you know, my, my saying is if you're doing everything right in the other areas of your life, you don't really have to make a budget. You don't have to penny pinch, meaning if you're saving the right amount, you know, if you're keeping an eye on taxes, if your balance sheet is protected from, you know, major threats, if you're doing all that stuff, you don't really need a budget. But one thing I don't see people do, or I see them reluctant to do is to build in that budget, that travel budget, that, um, that passion budget, you know, and that's one thing that I I encourage clients to do is to say, it's okay. You know, if you want to spend, let's say $10,000 a year on travel, well, let's just put that on your spreadsheet. Let's put it in your, as a line item and let's plan around that. Yeah. That becomes like a, yeah, like a non-negotiable, like, okay, here's, 
I'm going to do this. So now let's make it happen. Right, right. Just right so there, along with the uh, the electric bill. You know, we know we're going to yeah. dedicate three hundred dollars a month for electricity. Why not put, you know, X amount of dollars a month for your travel budget or your passion budget? Yep, I can, I can tell that you live in a metropolitan area like me. I'm just outside of Denver. My electric bill is around three hundred, and it's like I'm sure that some people would go, "Man, I'm in Oklahoma, and my if I had a three hundred dollar electric bill, I'd be going crazy." But yep, that's but yeah, that, that is true. Is we need to know what those blocks of non negotiable, um, even like stretch goals, but financial stretch goals that mm-hmm. it's like okay. I'm now at the point in my life and career that I'm going to do this, this thing. So plan for it, put it in there. What are some other mistakes that you see um, women making when planning for the future? You know, I, I would say one of the biggest in, and because sometimes you don't know what you don't know, but I would say one of the biggest issues is where you're putting your money. Yeah. So, you know, I, I have a little process that I like to go through with clients when we first meet and, and I call it stamps three rules in which rule number one is save 15 to 20% of your gross income. So that's one big issue, not saving enough, regardless of where you're putting it. So I I tell folks, if you're saving 20% of your gross income and you're putting it in a coffee can in the backyard, that's better than just putting 3% in your 401k and not doing any more. So it's the amount of money that you save versus um, where you're putting it. Then the next step would be, okay, now I'm, I'm saving a healthy amount. You know, sometimes you can't get to 20%, but we, we start with whatever we can do. But once you're saving a healthy amount, the next question is, where are we putting it? Are we putting it in tax deferred vehicles where we might get hit with a huge tax bill on down the road? Are, are we putting it in a, in a high feed vehicle where that feed drag is really going to lower the rate of return overall? So not saving enough and not putting them in the right vehicles and having them diversified. And when I say diversified, I don't mean just diversified in the stock market. Of course, you should be diversified in the stock market, but there are multiple asset classes. And I think one thing that separates me from a lot of planners is that, and maybe that's because of my background was originally in real estate, but I'm a huge fan of multiple asset classes. Yeah. So there, there are vehicles and there's products and there's all these things we can put our money into. And I, you know, I ask people, why do you think they exist? All of these products and vehicles exist for a certain reason. So it's a matter of finding what works for you, but really diversify. You know, when we can move into actual real estate ownership and business ownership, you know, that's a great thing compared to just having all of our money in a 401k. So um, saving the amount of money that you should save, putting them in the right vehicles and diversifying those vehicles. Yeah, and uh, am I correct in thinking this, and maybe this is a a, a quote that I'm getting wrong, but in my mind, I remember that it was attributed to Warren Buffett that says, put all your eggs in one basket and then watch that basket. That is that is an accurate quote. Okay. Um, No, that's why not be an accurate mindset. yeah, that has been said. Yep. <laughs> Let me rephrase <laughs> right. that. As when I say it's an accurate quote, that that has been uttered uh, in the history of of the English language. Uh, but I think that was really, in my opinion, the way that landed on me is I think that was more of it, when, when you have a venture, when you're starting something, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. So if I'm going to start a new business, it's going to be really difficult for me to yes. start that business and then go start business B, and then go start business C all simultaneously, right? Um, If I can start business A and then just go all in, once it's up and running, I can start, you know, looking at other things. So that's why, that's the way I took that. Yeah. Um, but and I would yeah, even as it relates to, that, to your money, I definitely wouldn't put it all in one basket. A hundred percent. I mean, really. I mean, because most people could watch that quote unquote financial basket and go, I don't know what I'm watching for. So I think that one mindset right. would be. Um, Throughout life, I think that we mentioned life coach or financial goals. Your life plan will shift and pivot a little bit, not 90 degree, 180 degree, but these little nuances, right? So I mm-hmm. think that maybe mm-hmm. that one quote that came to my mind, we're kind of, let's dissect it out a little bit and go, okay, you know how I mentioned to diversify? In this time of your career, um, client, you know, uh, female over 50, we're going to be putting this into place. So why don't you go ahead and study up all on X, whatever it is, so that you're well aware of it. Now, you know, that, that your client is not going to make the decisions or the 
to execute things. That's what you're going to do. But you certainly don't want to make moves on their behalf that they don't even understand what's going on. So they're watching the basket um, action could be just learning all about the whatever sector, industry, investment that you're um, recommending for them because you, you want to be, um, I've heard this one, I don't know where this one comes from, but an active participant in your own rescue. Not that people need to be rescued, mm-hmm. but in their own plan, be active, understand what Stamp is telling you. And it's like, oh, yeah, um, maybe I ought to be doing whatever, you know, putting some of my resources into this type of life insurance uh, plan or real estate, like you mentioned. But understand what is happening and then study up on it. That's watching the basket so that if someone said to you at a dinner party, hey, what is your financial? And they're like, I don't know. This guy just didn't know. You need to be involved and understand what is going on. Well, I'm glad you said that, Mike. You know, planners typically, we all agree on a few core things, right? So, for yeah. instance, we agree that you, you have to put money away for the future, and we agree that you should mitigate risk when you can. Uh, but from from a way we we transfer that information can get uh, can be very different planner to planner. And that's the one thing that I've prided myself on, and, and I've gotten a lot of really great feedback is from an educational standpoint, just like, and I actually use that example that you use. When oh, I wow. work with a client, I, I don't want you to be at a dinner party and somebody asks you, hey, well, what are you doing for your retirement? And you say, well, I'm doing this, this, and this. And then when the person asks you, well, why are you doing that? Yeah. You say, well, I don't know. Stamp just told yep. me to do that. Yep. Um, so there's a level of empowerment, educational and financial empowerment that that I really want my clients to have. And I think we do a good job of that. And now that's as much as you want. And what I mean by that is some clients really love to dig into the weeds and really love the numbers. Other clients are like, hey, just give me a 30,000 foot view. But either way, I think that's important for people, you know, with their money to know what they're doing with it. Where is it going? How is it growing? How is it going to be taxed when you're ready for it? That's all really, really important. So from an education first mindset, Uh, It's something I've always prided myself on. Yeah, um, I I think that that helps you to become what in in kind of business, what I like to say is you're then the guide because your client is the hero of the story is is you're guiding them and making recommendations, but not forcible, you know, decisions. You're just going, hey, you know, here's why this is really important. You should consider this one. Now, I know a lot of people think that this other alternative is a good idea. So let me just kind of compare these for you because here's some pros, cons. What what do you think, uh, you know, based on what we've talked about? I think that you guiding the process helps them to feel empowered and part of the process, not just like, you know, because I would venture to say that if you think about stigma or, you know, uh, cliches, many times a female would feel like they're the ones that are just, you know, sh- shuffled around and just told just do this because, you know, society's always whatever the case is. So I think that your education approach would really resonate well with your target audience. Have you noticed that people even uh, uh, women even saying that to you? No, I really have noticed that. Um, you know, there, you know, I have some some Google reviews. I have um, I have some personal testimonials that I've received from clients, and that's one of the things that that's really stood out is um, being very thankful and appreciative of the process and learning and and knowing what they're doing. And and the thing about it is those statistics are true. And you know, another reason I like to serve this community. Um, so women on average earn about 20% less than their male counterparts. So if, if you're in the same industry and you're earning 20% less, you know, we have a little bit of making up to do when you hit retirement, because when you hit retirement, the costs aren't 20% less for you. You know, when you go to buy a loaf of bread and a guy goes to buy a loaf of bread, you don't get a 20% discount just because you're a female. Yeah. Right. So we have to make up for that. Uh, uh, statistically, about about 50% of women are unmarried when they reach retirement versus 30% for men. So right. there, there's a big gap of women stepping into retirement being on their own, not having that second income or that second 401k uh, to live off of. And and women hold, you know, a larger percentage of the student loan debt. Almost two thirds huh. of the student loan debt are, are owned by women. So it's another thing they have to navigate. And so, um, yeah. you know, to your point about education, it's it's not only is it education, but it's also, again, the demographic and and looking out for these threats and just preparing for them. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, some of those points you bring up on, on you know, women living longer and, and having this percent more, you know, I think that people have always heard those kind of stats before, but then when you really bring it all together into now, you know what, here's some of the ramifications that need to be thought of regarding retirement. And I would venture to say that the phrase or the concept of retirement is as scary to people as speaking in public, you know, like they say, it's like, <laughs> it's this big unknown. Like, you know, yeah. whenever retirement is, am I going to have enough? And what if it, is the tax rate going to be? And what if, what if, what if? So I think that, yeah. you know, your service to um, your clients is so huge to be able to to help educate them. And I love the the big freeze when I go to your website that says rethink retirement. You know, what what is yeah. when, when you uh, if you were to give a one sentence explanation of rethink retirement, what is the call to action there? I would say it. it if if I could just make it succinct, you don't always have to or want to do what everyone else is doing. Mm. And there's a reason, you know, I learned this really early in my career, The 10% of the population owns 90% of the wealth. Mm. Well, why is that? D d it, when you hear that statistic, that's probably telling you that that 10% does something slightly different than the other 90%. That's why they are in the position that they're in. So rethink your retirement speaks into rethinking where you're putting your money, being okay to do things differently with your money than the other 90%. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Well, Stamp, I really appreciate you coming on. And if um, anyone is interested in learning more about how you serve uh, women over 50 and, and helping them make the wise decisions for retirement, what's the best way that they can reach out and connect with you? Well, my website is lmstamper.com, so that's always an easy way to find me. Um, if you just Google LM Stamper, I have my LinkedIn page, my Facebook page. You know, those are all channels that you can reach me. Uh, my business line, you know, it's it's open for texting and call. That's 817-846-3005. Uh, but between all those channels, you should be able to reach me. Excellent. Well, Stan, thanks so much for coming on. It was a real pleasure talking with you today. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.